following is a production of Cary TV, the town of Cary's government access channel. Call to order the September 27th meeting of the Cary Town Council, and at this time I'll recognize Ms. Bush for our ceremonial opening. Uh, thank you. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> One of those I pledge, pledge of allegiance, allegiance to the flag, flag of, of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. now at the adoption of the agenda, I would entertain a motion to adopt our agenda. So moved. There's second. a motion. Is there a second? Right here. A second. Discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. We now move to item B, the consent agenda portion of tonight's agenda. For the benefit of the people watching on TV, we're going to take a moment to <coughs> read consent agenda items. I'll point out that one vote approves all consent agenda items. On the consent agenda we have this evening, approval of the minutes, approval of a tax report, appointing Richard Roddy to the Zoning Board of Adjustment, calling for public hearings on annexations, appointing our North Carolina League of Municipalities voting delegate, and ratifying the vested rights certificate we approved at our last meeting. Mrs. Robinson will briefly summarize our Operations Committee Consent Agenda items, and Mr. France will do the same for our Planning and Development Committee Consent Agenda, consent agenda items. Ms. Robinson. Thank you very much. The September 13th meeting of the Operations Committee had seven items on its agenda. The first item is traffic calming projects. We unanimously recommended installing 16 humps in three neighborhoods. Those include Legacy at Carpenter Village, the park at West Lake, and Upchurch Farms. Um, the second item is the sidewalk improvements bid year 2012, part A. The third was approval of a re resolution to receive grant award. Uh, the next item was the Parks, Recreation, Cultural Resources Department policy review and update. The next item was a bid award, on-site reclaimed water line extension. Uh, the sixth item was public works and utilities department change and exempt position classification. And the last item is the Town of Cary comments on NCDOT's proposed widening of I-440 and US-1. And that item had the most discussion. And in that, we made um, six recommendations that um, pertain to the aesthetics uh, of the future project, as well as 
um, pedestrian movements such as the greenways, um, pedestrian access over Walnut Street, and um, all, of, all of the network that surrounds this project. So um, those are written in the agenda and any citizen of course may um, read that and add any input um, to the town or to NCBOT directly if you have any comments. Very good, thank you. Mr. Franks. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, our September 20th uh, Planning and Development Committee meeting had five items, four of which were unanimously approved by the board. Uh, one will be on for discussion later uh, this evening. The first was Green Level West Medical Office, request for waiver for reclaimed water line extension. Second was Parkside Town Commons, request to waive required road improvements along Old Kelly Chapel Road extension. Uh, third was an amendment to the Alston Activity Center concept plan. And fourth would be request for review comments from Wake County on a Swift Creek land management plan variance. If anybody would like to learn more about those items, you can visit the town website at townofcary.org. Very good. Would any council member like any item pulled from consent for discussion? Mayor, I have some questions about the Parkside Town Commons request to waive the required road improvements. So if I could just have staff comment, to give us summary on that and, and you can pull that and we'll okay. then you give us That'd be great. okay so uh, would anyone like to propose the adoption of the consent agenda uh, with that one except minus 3b so moved second okay there's a motion and a second further discussion all in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed motion carries <coughs> unanimously and let me make a note of item 3b that we'll come back to later that takes us to item C on the agenda. Uh, Mrs. Bush will present the Cyber Security Awareness Month proclamation at this time. Mrs. Bush. Uh, I'd like to invite Police Department Lieutenant Steve Funke to join me at the podium. Pull it down. Um, many of you know that before I joined the council, I've been a strong advocate for cybersecurity awareness. I've taught many of you how to uh, turn your phones on and off. Um, some of you how to do <laughs> new things on your pieces of equipment. And I've been lucky enough to teach internet security classes to all kinds of classes in high school, elementary schools, and at the National Charity League. Um, you might not know, though, that October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. It, this is the ninth, I believe it's the ninth time we've had the October Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and it's all about helping people be informed. You, when you leave your house, most of us, turn, uh, lock our doors. When we leave our cars, we often lock our doors, but you'd be surprised how many people don't lock their phones, don't put a password, um, on their account that's not their dog's name, their child's name, um, or maybe their address. So it's important to make people aware that we have a shared responsibility when it comes to cybersecurity awareness, that um, someone could get into my account as an example and maybe get Don France's account information. So it is all connected, we're all connected. And so I am thrilled to be able to um, read this proclamation give you all a little bit more information about cybersecurity awareness and then asked uh, uh, Mr. Funke to also make some comments as well. Uh, one last thing, I'd like to also um, not only thank the police department, if you're not aware, there's a page on the police department cybercrime page that gives you some great tips and techniques and I'll show some of you later the personal um, enhancements you can make to your phone to make it more secure. Um, but there's also a lot of wealth of experience in our technology services. So I'd like to not only thank the police department, but also the great department of technology services and what they do for not only all of us at the town, personally, on town council, but many of the citizens. So designating October 2012 as Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Whereas technology plays a vital role in our daily lives and in the future of our town, state, and nation, the internet provides a simple mechanism for our citizens, schools, libraries, and businesses to perform a variety of tasks, 
including keeping in touch with family and friends, managing personal finances, be performing research and enhancing education, and conducting business. Additionally, businesses and service providers are increasingly reliant on information systems to support financial services, energy, telecommunications, transportation, utilities, healthcare, and emergency response systems. Internet users and our information infrastructure face an increasing threat of malicious cyber attack, loss of privacy from spyware and malware, and significant financial and personal privacy losses due to identity theft and fraud. There are numerous national initiatives that provide education about cybersecurity. The Stop, Think, Connect campaign uses a common sense approach to help all digital citizens stay safer and more secure online. Stop, before you use the internet, take time to understand the risks and learn how to spot potential problems. Think. Take a moment to be certain the path ahead is clear. Watch for warning signs and consider how your actions online could impact your safety or your families. Connect. Enjoy the internet with greater confidence, knowing that you've taken the right steps to safeguard yourself and your computer. The town's 2008 Biannual Citizen Satisfaction Survey indicated that 96% of Cary residents at that time had access to the internet. In the 2012 survey, we learned that almost 55% of Cary residents own smartphones. And of that number, 41% use them for online banking and shopping. And in April 2007, the Cary Town Council took proactive steps to increase cybersecurity and citizen awareness of these threats by establishing a computer-related crime activity unit in the police department. Today, the town cyber crime unit is the only full-time unit in Wake County. It employs three full-time and one part-time staff who work diligently to protect our citizens' cyber safety and well-being. They also routinely assist other local, state, and federal agencies with cyber crime-related cases. And in the past year, these detectives have been assigned over 60 cases. The police department also maintains a webpage at thetownofcary.org that contains guidelines and resources to help keep our families and children safe online. In 2012, the town council created a technology task force comprised of Cary residents with a wide array of technology-related experience to determine how the town can better use technology to serve its citizens. Cyberspace security is a critical component of that work. Town staff and officials understand that internet security is a shared responsibility in which everyone plays a critical role. Raising awareness of cyberspace security in our community will help protect the town's information infrastructure and our citizens. Now, therefore, I, Lori Bush, on behalf of the entire Cary Town Council, am pleased to partner with the United States Department of Homeland Security the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center, the National Association of State Chief Information Officers, and the National Cybersecurity Alliance, and declare October as Ni National Cybersecurity Awareness Month in Cary. I urge Cary residents to learn more about cybersecurity, put that knowledge into practice in their homes, schools, workplaces, and business, proclaim this 27th day of September 2012. Thank you very much. You're welcome to make comments. Uh, I'll, I'll keep them brief. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bush, very much. Uh, thanks to Council. Um, as you know, we do have a, a, a full-time cyber unit um, that I <coughs> truly believe does some of the most important work that we do as an agency. I, I say that without reservation. Um, I do, you know, the internet has given us opportunities to, as, as citizens, as businesses, as governments, to, to make giant leaps forward. Uh, but it also opens us up as individuals and as businesses and as governments to, to be victimized uh, in countless new ways. Um, and we've got uh, very knowledgeable people that, that work for us to, to solve these crimes. Um, but th there's, the only thing better than solving a, an internet crime is preventing one. Uh, and, if, and if individuals can prevent themselves from being uh, victimized, then, then uh, that, that is the best outcome, to, to, to not be a victim in the first place. Uh, we do have great cybersecurity tips on our website. I encourage 
everyone to look at them. And if, if there's any questions about how to employ them, uh, give us a call. We'll absolutely help you walk, walk through it and, uh, uh, and make you as safe as we possibly can. Uh, again, uh, thank you for the commitment to the unit, to the, to the agency. Uh, I think our citizens are well served by, by that commitment. Thanks, thanks very much. Thank you, Lieutenant. And please okay. thank your team for all you do to keep us safe, cyber-wise and otherwise. Thank you. I certainly will. Thanks very much. Thank you. We're now on item D. The next two agenda items are public speaks out and public hearings. We've included instructions for speaking at these forums on the printed agenda. If you'd like to speak, please take a seat in the rows to my right that are shown as reserved and follow the instructions on the agenda. Public speaks out speakers have up to three minutes for their comments and speakers may speak on any topic not listed as a public hearing under item E. I will enforce the three minute time limit to be fair to all of our speakers. There's a timer located on the podium, which is lit up right now, and it will be green for the first two and a half minutes, yellow for the last 30 seconds, and at the end of three minutes will be a flashing red, and at that time, I'll mm -hmm. interrupt you and ask you to conclude your comments. I'll thank all of our speakers in advance for adhering to our guidelines. So at this time, I would like to open up Public Speaks Out for anyone who would like to speak on an issue that is not a public hearing. I see no one in the first two rows. Oh, please, come down. Other one. Town Council. Uh, I have passed around a paper for the Meridian at Harris Point Apartments. Could I get your name, please, for the record? Craig McCrary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, on the first page, you'll see a printout from the actual project. The red line indicates the tree clearing, uh, tree protection fence, and the green line indicates where a greenway will be put. So the greenway is well within the tree clearing area. As we go to page one, it shows the, or picture one, it shows that protection fence. And in the green way area to the left, it shows an existing trail. Notice the trees, the shade, but you also notice any grass or anything there that would retard erosion. Moving over to the next page. All these pictures were taken with the level on zero degree and with a 45 degree metal carpenter square to give you an idea of angles. Again, this level is started at the tree protection fence and you can already see there's a three foot drop within eight feet of the fence. This drop accelerates as you go down and you'll notice in all of these pictures that there is no evidence of any runoff, any silting, anything cut by moving water. This area is held together by trees and weaves and sparse vegetation. It's a fragile area. And the next picture, page four, shows the drop off. And down below there, almost uh, more than 45 degrees down is 106 Empire Circle, their driveway, and Blackwater Creek, which is an impaired waterway. So there is absolutely nothing to stop water going downhill except existing trees and weaves. This is moving down the hill a little bit further with the driveway in 106 Empire and you can actually see the creek. The level there is at zero degrees bubble. It is level and the 45 degree metal carpenter's triangle is on the end to show you that this exceeds much more than a 45 degree down angle with no vegetation to hold anything in place. And at page six, this shows the same shot a little bit closer. This section of Blackwater Creek rises seven and a half feet within a few minutes of a heavy rainstorm. It goes from a half inch deep to seven and a half feet. It moves at 20 to 30 miles an hour. 
and it enters several properties and comes right up to our homes. There is nothing stopping this. This is a result of the Harrison Point Shopping Center and construction upstream. Harrison Point Shopping Center has no retention whatsoever. Page seven is the back of my house, 104 Empire Circle, and you can see the drop off there. What you don't see is the last 10 to 15 feet is straight down. Mr. Prairie, I'm sorry your time has expired. Very much want to uh, continue reading this. If you could send your additional comments in an email and hand them hand your email to the town clerk. Any information you could send us, we'd like. Closing is they're about to cut. You have knowledge, you have the ability, and perhaps the responsibility to not clear cut that green trail and give us as much vegetation and erosion protection as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else for Public Speaks Out this evening? <coughs> I see no one, so I'll close Public Speaks Out and we'll move to public hearings. This is item E on your agenda. Same, rule, same rules apply for public hearings as for public speaks out with the exception of one rule. Instead of three minutes, you now have five minutes for your comments. We're at item E1, which is the Howell Track public hearing, which consists of an annexation 12A9 and a rezoning 12RZ12. We're gonna hear a report from our staff followed by the applicant, and we're gonna open up the public hearing. The council will not take action tonight, instead, we're gonna refer this to our planning and zoning board for their recommendation. The annexation will, will be brought back to the council at a future time. At this time, I'll recognize Ms. Grannon of our staff who will present this item, Ms. Grannon. Thank you, good evening. For your consideration is a request to rezone approximately 14.8 acres from residential 40 with a Wake County zoning designation to transitional residential conditional use. The property is located outside of Cary's ETJ and outside of Cary's corporate limits. Therefore, annexation is required before Cary zoning can be applied to the subject property. And the property owner has submitted an annexation petition, which will run concurrently with this case. This vicinity map shows the location of the subject property, which is located north of Farm Pond Road and west of Davis Drive. And here's a close-up aerial view of the subject property that shows existing conditions with single-family residential property and uh, some vacant land as well. Carrie's land use designation for the subject property is low-density residential, and this is a designation that dates on this area from the adoption of the land use plan in 1996. The current zoning is Wake County, residential 40 and the applicant is seeking transitional residential conditional use. The conditions proposed by the applicant are that the density be limited to a maximum of three dwelling units per acre and that the use on the subject property be limited to single family residential detached homes. According to Kerry's GIS maps, the site is impacted by stream buffers and floodways and field determination would be required at the time of site plan review. This slide shows you that there is a proposed multi-use uh, trail along Davis Drive that would impact the subject par property. Cary's transportation plan designates Davis Drive as an existing thoroughfare and Farm Pond Road as a collector road. There are no transit services in the immediate vicinity of the subject property. Property owners within 400 feet were notified by mail of the request. The property was posted and advertised according to LDO requirements. The subject property being outside Cary's ETJ and corporate limits is not eligible for a protest petition when it's associated with initial zoning and an annexation. However, staff has received several calls and wanted to let you know that there were a number of concerns from adjacent property owners, uh, traffic, the impact of this zoning on property values, questions about compatibility with the existing neighborhood, and connectivity for the future <coughs> proposed development to Farm Pond Road. At this time, I'd like to call upon the applicant to describe the request. It, because they don't, they extend it.
Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the Town Council. My name is Adam Ashbaugh. I'm with L Star Management here in Raleigh. Uh, we're before you tonight, as Deborah mentioned, requesting the annexation and rezoning for the property, um, uh, you know, and as Deborah described and it's spelled out in the staff report that you have. I've reviewed the staff report and I don't have uh, really much to add to what she's already provided, but I would like to share with you a little bit about how we arrived at this point in the process and are before you tonight. Um, as with all projects that LSTAR takes on, we, um, we engage the existing property owners. We, we um, work closely with them to review their concerns, address their issues as best we can, and uh, certainly within the framework of what the town of Cary ordinance requirements are, you, you know, we seek to address as many of them as we can in both rezoning, site plan, and building construction, home construction. Uh, to that end, we've met with the adjacent property owners on two separate occasions. Uh, we will continue to work with them through the process of the rezoning, the site plan approvals, uh, and, and even into the construction, the platting, and the home building of this development if it is approved. Um, based upon the meetings that we have, um, and, and as you've seen, or as Deborah has presented, emails that have come into the town, uh, two predominant issues were raised. Uh, the first is uh, traffic. As the, the staff report um, indicates, the projected volume generated is not necessarily an issue, but what is at issue are connection points, both to the existing Stonecrest neighborhood to the north, to Farm Pond Road, potentially to Davis Drive. Um, again, these are, these are site plan matters and we, we will continue to address these matters both, both with town staff and with DOT as we move into the site plan stage. Um, the second issue or, or the major issue that we heard at these meetings with the uh, adjacent property owners is one of compatibility. Uh, Stonecrest, our, our rezoning request is intended to create a subdivision that is very similar and, and replicates Stonecrest and really just becomes an extension of the Stonecrest neighborhood. Um, this rezoning would allow development of homes that are similar. Um, we will introduce uh, architecture that's similar, things of that nature to make this neighborhood completely compatible with Stonecrest. The other um, surrounding neighborhood is really the Farm Pond Road uh, residents. There's uh, six or eight two acre or, or, or so sized lots there. And what we'll do uh, in that instance is create perimeter buffers and screenings so that we provide a separation from what we plan to do from those existing residents. Uh, in summary, we feel that this proposed zoning is appropriate at this location. It's consistent with the future land use plan and it will be compatible with the surrounding uh, existing developments. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. At this time, I'm gonna open up the public hearing for anyone who would like to speak for or against this request for annexation and rezoning. And at this time, I'd invite the first speaker forward. My name is uh, Wes Hall. I'm the uh, president of the HOA of Stonecrest. And basically we're submitting a uh, petition that we support the rezoning of the Howell property to the residential uh, density that's been uh, classified by um, Adam. As long as the existing ordinances that carry requires the con connectivity of Gravel Brook to Farm Pond, the widening of um, Davis to Farm Pond, and I think also I've heard about existing greenway being installed as well. Um, it's our main concern that those roads are widened. We'd also like to add in the possibility of, um, I know this comes later in site planning, to have a stoplight or traffic light put in at the intersection of Farm Pond and Davis, as it, their site distance there is, is a lot less than ours as far as um, make sure we have a safe exit from these neighborhoods on the Davis Drive. And it lists all the reasons why here as far as we have bus, buses coming in out of our neighborhood um, in the morning and afternoon. Our existing exit route from our neighborhood is one lot deep. It's gonna hold about three or four cars. So adding 
40 cars to this entrance, and only this entrance would be unsafe uh, for our neighborhood as well as our kids who are there waiting to be picked up, picked up from school for school buses. So that's why we want the connectivity plan that is existing in the town of Cary to be fulfilled for this property um, to what we've heard from the Beezer pitch for this property as well from LSTAR as well. So that we, as Suncrest, give our support to this um, annexation and rezoning of this property. Very good, thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and uh, Town Council. My name is Martin Baum. I live at 6012 Farm Pond Road, directly behind uh, the property in question this evening. And I've been chosen to be the speaker for the Farm Pond Road residents for this evening. Um, we do have a couple of other people that will speak just briefly behind me as well. Um, however, we, we fully understand um, in the uh, copy of the zoning uh, data sheet that, that we were presented with or, or, put, or pulled out here is that we had no right to uh, issue a protest petition because the land is not currently uh, in uh, the Cary uh, annexation or in the town of Cary land. So we're kind of here tonight to give you our verbal uh, petition of protest. Um, I'll be very short. Uh, this, is a ver this is an existing uh, rural uh, area. The reason we all moved there was for the rural area and for the um, uh, the large size lots, I know Mr. Elspa said that there's two acre lots there. The average lot there is basically anywhere from four to 14 acres. Um, it is clearly uh, delineated um, from the neighborhoods next door by tree lines, streamlines, buffers, etc. It's a wild, I, we kind of call it a wildlife preserve. There's deer, beaver, uh, fox, coyote. I mean, there's tons of animals there all the time. Uh, the main reason we moved out there and, and all built, um, I'll say even in today's economy, mil, uh, million dollar plus homes was for the privacy um, of the area. Um, part of our, our concern um, is that under the current use plan, as noted, it is zoned as R40. Um, we understand um, that it is R40, that they're trying to get transitional use and to cut it down to 6,000 square foot lots so that they can get 40 homes in there along with the 54 homes next door. We also understand that that's less than 100 homes so that one egress uh, is, uh, is applicable versus having two egresses for neighbors. Um, as, our, as, as Wes pointed out, there's a significant traffic issue there as well. Um, and then taking it from the R40 down to the transitional use and putting in 6,000 square foot lots. Um, we feel as neighbors, um, based on the, uh, the subdivision plat that was recorded in 1995, the T.J. Howell subdivision plat, and what all of us bought into in all of our deeds and exhibits in all of our deeds, which I'd be happy to present all of this to you as well, um, it clearly states that in this subdivision that there should be no lots under 20,000 square feet. Um, that's what we were all sold on, the people that have been there for 17 years, to, the, to myself who uh, built the most recent house in there eight years ago, which is directly behind the property. So you can imagine we're not overly excited um, about that as well. Um, I'm trying to actually follow your, your, the rezoning data sheet and sticking to the facts. Um, of what's pointed out here this evening as well. Um, there's also a, on the existing map or the old map, there is a mention of a road uh, going from Jenks Road to as a feeder road that was just mentioned to Farm Pond Road. Um, we have evidence of a map dated uh, 9 of 95 that Mr. Howell made a road, uh, I'm sorry, made a deal uh, with the county of Wake County to take that from a private to a county road and it clearly states on our map right here that that road is no longer, uh, former road is, was closed. Um, and that property was redivided into lots, which two neighbors, one of the neighbors here tonight lives on that. So, uh, so in order for that to go through, there would have to be a condemnation of those people's property. Um, and there was talk of a water line going through there about a year and a half ago. This was discussed, that water line was canceled, which you probably know, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. 
and was realigned to Davis Drive, and then a different line will come straight down uh, Farm Pond Road going out to the back of where Farm Pond is. Um, again, um, you know, point number five uh, in the qualification of this, of having a severe impact um, on, the, um, on the property. We feel it not only will have a severe impact on the already declining values of, of our homes there, we feel there's seven homes on the street that it's gonna be at least a $100,000 impact on each home. I'm a previous developer myself, so I know exactly what L-Star Homes is going through. I've done the calculations myself. If they can prove to me that they're gonna make more than four or $500,000 on flipping this to some builders, and we're gonna lose at least a million dollars in today's economy. So we feel again that it's, you know, they're doing this at the neighbor's expense and why we all moved out there. And more importantly, has been pointed out several times, I'm my son. You. I'm sorry, your sorry. time's expired. Yeah, um, traffic is, is the biggest concern. My son was almost killed two years ago at the end of our street. There's been six major accidents in five years. So traffic and safety is a major, major concern of that area. So thank you for your time. Thank I you. appreciate it. And we'd be happy to answer any questions at a later time. Thank, thank you. you. Good evening. My name is uh, Jim Sherrill. I'm also a resident of Farm Pond Road. Um, I would just like to talk about the main issues, the traffic issue, uh, as Mr. Baum mentioned, um, and also talk about the, the farm pond extension that Mr. Howe traded. So we have the map and it's on the book, uh, 1987, uh, it, was, it was done and the map is uh, book 1995, page 286, where Mr. Howe traded <coughs> the land so that farm pond road could not be accessed and cut through. So currently, based on that, uh, we have two houses are sitting right in the middle of that track where that road was potentially supposed to go through. So we, it, we have the documentation that, you know, the road has been stopped. So now the traffic issue. Uh, as Mr. Baum said, we've had seven accidents on Farm Pond Road in the last four years. Um, very serious accidents. His son was almost killed. Uh, a typical morning on Farm Pond Road, besides watching the, the deer and other animals and stuff, is you go out to Davis Drive, and everybody knows Davis Drive traffic is, is bad. So you sit there anywhere from 7.15 to 8.15, it takes you eight, nine minutes to get out, unless somebody lets you out. And then you get on Davis Drive and you make your way to whichever way you're going. Same thing coming in uh, in the evenings. Um, I don't know if everybody knows where, um, Salem Church Road is. The traffic backs all the way from Salem Church Road all the way down past the curve uh, on Davis Drive. And unless somebody lets you cut through, then you set and hold up traffic. So obviously our concern with this subdivision is it will bring in potentially 90 more cars. Um, that and the size of the lots and the style of the house, we just don't feel like fits in with our neighborhood. Everybody bought out at Farm Pond Road because of a lifestyle. Um, I was a Cary resident. I lived in Cary for 20 years. I loved Cary, but you know, I had a house, my neighbor, we were on four acre lots, and I just got tired of being able to hear everything that was going on. So I met with Mr. Howe, bought the land, and we all bought lifestyles. That's the reason we moved out there. And we understand that the land has to be developed. We just think that 6,000 square acre lots is too small, um, the, the home style will not fit in their subdivision. And other than that, any questions? I'd be happy to ask any questions. Thank you. Public hearing is one way, unfortunately. I know, I know, <laughs> I know. It's, we're three months away from that meeting, but I just did that. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good evening, I'm Raymond Davis. I live, obviously, on Farm Pond Road. I want to take you back to October two, 1987. I had a distinct opportunity at that time to meet a man by the name of Thurman Jackson Howe, T.J. Howe. We were moving from the western part of the state here, and obviously we were looking for more space, and uh, Mr. Howe had some land for sale. I went down the street, spent half a day with him, and uh, he paid Baxter Johnson's construction company to put the farm pond in at 
state d o t specifications as well as underground service mr howe made some comments and he said this is a private street this will always be a private road and he introduced me that day to a plat of the t j house subdivision of which you've heard earlier and i remember mr house comments he said uh, now this is nineteen eighty seven he said there's enough people that live on top of each other and carry it now a good neighbor needs space to be a good neighbor i bought into that because we have a great neighborhood because we have space somewhere in your documents the city of cary and mr howe in 1995 94 95 or 96 agreed with the town of cary as mr sherrill spoke there was a thoroughfare that was scheduled to come through farm pond that would connect howe road which was named after his family somewhere cary city council and mr howe differed on whether the road should be private or public and he agreed to make it public if the city of Cary agreed to take that thoroughfare road away from the zoning or away from that. You have your documents, you need to research that. The agreement was made and now we live on a public road. It close, we all bought covenants that joins the entire TJ House subdivision. Maybe it's for greed or need or some other reason. Now we question where the integrity of covenants and laws and purchases we made is far or is of less value than the need to develop some property. Our community stands unified together in what we were told and what we documented and what we've believed in and support. We appreciate your interest and concern as we voice our opinions. Any questions to me? We can't ask you questions, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Anyone else for this public hearing? Thank you for having me. My name is Rachel Babnick. I do not live on Farm Pond Road, but I live adjacent to it at Sherwood Greens on Forest Place. If you look on the sites, you'll see there's two ponds on that particular site that's getting ready to, to be developed. Also, at one point, Stonecrest had a pond, and when it was developed through the town of Cary, the pond that I paid extra to live on was basically destroyed, okay? And I don't want to see that happen again. If you pass that by sediment or call it turbidity, you remember this because you didn't come to the meeting at my home. After two years of fighting and trying to keep the wildlife in place, the ducks, the geese, it's a dead pond. And just today, there was another issue. Thank you for helping with that. Because they still are destroying the forest back there, the tree preserve area, they're dumping dirt and it's coming down in my pond. It's killing off those ducks, those geese, the, the wildlife, the deer, they have nowhere to run, the fish have nowhere to swim, the ducks don't even bother landing because it's too dirty. And you know, to go ahead and destroy another two ponds that feed into that pond and feed into the Cape Fear River Basin I think it's despicable and you need to stop it. Thank you. Anyone else for this public hearing? Anyone at all? I'll close this public hearing, open it up to council members for questions or comments. I'm sorry, we got one more, I'm sorry. Keep the public hearing open. Are we okay with that? Okay, mm -hmm. town attorney says yes. <clears throat> Sorry about that. No problem. Wasn't quick enough. Uh, my name is Kyle Corkum. I'm uh, one of the managing partners at L Star. I just wanted to reassure everybody that um, you know we're we're a very experienced development company. 
our, our firm collectively has developed over 60,000 lots. Um, our senior team has developed thousands of lots in Cary. We understand that there's a, a very, very delicate balance and a huge responsibility on our part to, to see the, the town's wishes move forward as progress makes its way through the town, but to be sensitive to how there can be at times conflicting um, influences. And we're very, very keenly aware of that. You've seen us come before you in the past looking at similar kinds of issues. And all I can say is that these are, these are valid points that have been made. There are no easy answers to these things, um, but we are absolutely committed to working very, very closely with both neighborhoods and people that live in the surrounding area to address all these concerns. We take it very, very seriously. And I would simply ask you to give us the opportunity to work with them over this very, very long, very comprehensive um, process that you have in place so that we can find an accord that, that, that marries the sometimes competing interests but also advances the town's goals as well. So thank you for the opportunity tonight and uh, look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Anyone else for this public hearing? <laughs> Hi, I'm Kim Smith and I live on Farm Pond Road. So to follow, I would like to redirect your attention back to our covenants. Our covenants were showed to you earlier. Is that better? Um, and it does reflect that we as a neighborhood bought into this neighborhood on the covenants of 20,000 square feet minimum to put a home on. So please reflect back to that, remember that, and there should be no other further discussion about going less than 20,000 square feet for a home site. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone at all? Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing again and open it up to council members for questions or comments. Ms. Robinson. I have a few little questions. Um, I understand that the density would be fewer than th three units per acre, but is the intent to make those lots about the same size as the ones to the north? I mean, I've heard 6,000 square feet. Is, that, is the intent to match the lot size between those two subdivisions? The applicant would have the opportunity to address that. They would have to submit a zoning condition, um, the transitional residential conditional use zoning allows a minimum lot size of 6,000 square feet. Um, so they would have the opportunity if they wanted to introduce a zoning condition to increase the lot size. What are the lot sizes to the north? Uh, it's a transitional, I'm sorry, it's a residential eight conditional use. So the minimum lot size to the north is 8,000 eight. square feet. Okay, all right. Um, that will probably be something the applicant wants to look at. The other question I have is, we've heard a lot about the covenants that the people who bought property bought into. Is the land that's under this rezoning request subject to that covenant, or was that the original homestead of the person who had this we land don't, and he We never don't have subjected? any copies of the neighborhood covenants. When I spoke with Ms. Smith a few weeks ago and asked her about that. She was not sure if it was still active at that time. I was curious, but it's still not something that the town would monitor. But that's something that the applicant, the property owner is going to need to address because that is a private matter, but, but they certainly need to address that for their own. Um, what is that avenue? They, they the current property owner needs to make legally, sure. Personally? Right, they need, yes, that would be a private matter. A it's neighborhood a private agreement. Private agreement, right. Okay. Subject to litigation, but it's I not a What I think what you're asking mm -hmm. is, is the property under consideration, was that originally part of the farm, parm, farm pond neighborhood and subject to those covenants? That's what I'm wondering. That's the, that's I understand the that if you oh. sold some land out, you would require the person buying the land to be subject to these covenants, but he, did he apply those same covenants to himself and put his own land underneath those? And right, and, and I don't know that, okay. yeah. But that's, that's a question that the, um, that the applicant and the current property owner, uh, I'm sure, are going to want to do some research on, and, and we would all like to see the results of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, My question is kind of in the same vein. <clears throat> is, uh, several comments were made about the road and, and um, Mm -hmm. uh, arrangements that were made obviously with the county, not the town, since this isn't within our yeah, planning was, jurisdiction. So those need to be answered as absolutely. well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, Mr. France. Um, quick, 
question regarding connectivity. Uh, obviously, I'm hearing they want to connect to Farm Pond Road. The road that's to the north that just dead ends at the northern property line, would that be connected as well? This, this road here with the yes. neighborhood to the north, yes, connectivity to the adjacent neighborhood, Sherwood Greens would be a requirement. So there would, there would be a connection there and there would be a proposed connection at Farm Pond Road? Uh, that would be a site plan matter to address that at the time of site plan. Yes, uh, very, very possibly. Yes. I want to know what our ordinance requires. What our ordinance requires a north, south, east, yes. and west connection. Yes. So yes. the answer is yes. Okay. Would there also be a connection on to Davis? That's a DOT road, so the access point would be something evaluated at the time of, of site plan review. But it would be encouraged mm -hmm. under our, our mm -hmm. ordinances, correct? Because we're correct. expecting them to have an mm -hmm. east and west connector in addition yes. to the north and south. Other questions? Uh, just a go ahead. I was just going to say, just a comment is that one of the first speakers spoke of a um, light being there, and that would be a DOT decision. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. But that could be that cost could be borne by the developer if the NCDOT decided that it was merited. Right. If it meant that. Could you speak to the comment about it not being part of the ETJ or part of the corporate limits? It, is is that where the line is? is it, it seems like there's quite a bit that's within carry on this map. Does it really Everything stop with existing uh, color on it is in Cary's zoning jurisdiction. So the residents of Farm Pond Road are in Wake County. Okay, but not in the Cary ETJ. Correct. Correct. So the ETJ line is above? Because uh, Sherwood Forest right. is in Cary, correct? Sherwood Forest is in Cary, yeah. That has Cary zoning of um, residential eight conditional use. The pond that the speaker um, referenced that's being conti uh, continually damaged, uh, she lives in, for in Sherwood Forest. Her home is um, in this vicinity here. And it, the, the, the pond is more development occurring in um, Stonecrest that's causing the damage what, there, what is causing that additional there, damage? Well, there was a report that our staff is investigating and stormwater management is investigating, which involves some um, disturbance of a stream buffer in the adjacent neighborhood. Okay, like a, per, a, a homeowner's doing it? Correct. Okay. All right, so that, that's that being was, in, was doing yeah. that. Okay. And I, I, it's my recollection that as a result of the damage that was done to this pond, and it being brought to the council's attention several years ago, we actually raised our standards for stormwater runoff and protection. Is, so we would hope that any development here would be built to a higher standard than what we saw previously. We do have higher standards in place um, than when the um, uh, Stone Crest neighborhood was okay. developed, correct? Yeah, those, those lots in the floodplain wouldn't be allowed today, right? There, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. I don't think it looks like lots are in the floodplain. Uh, actually, no, they that they are. They're not platted in the stream buffer and the oh, urban okay. transition buffer. This is, you really have to do the field determination and have a, a detailed site site plan to see it specifically. Um, but the the subdivision plan did not show any lots actually in the urban transition buffer. Yeah, but n nonetheless, there was a, a massive amount of runoff. You saw the photographs. It went from this pristine, clear pond to one that is just riddled with sediment that just never settles. I mean, that's kind of a fascinating thing. It just kind of remains that turbid area. So, okay. can, can we, um, at, before this, we get additional information, I, um, one of the speakers spoke uh, about the um, traffic, or I'm sorry, not the traffic, the traffic accidents that have occurred mm -hmm. on Farm Pond Road. Do we know what those are attributed to? Are they? You know? No, I, I don't have that information. It seems quite a, a large number for such a small stretch of road. So seven and two or three years? I don't have any information on that. That was the first I'd heard of that. Um, yeah, I've witnessed one. I mean, what, it's just very difficult to get out of. So people take chances getting sure. in and out of that road. And when that happens, I mean, I saw one car that was completely flipped right there. It's, extremely dangerous. Any idea where the closest stoplight signalized 
yeah. is it's on Davis? How it's close? at Davis Park, Park to the north. Okay, so it's a good distance away. It's a very far distance away. So there is a possibility that DOT yes, could it's approve well, it's and well stop. well beyond the, okay. the limits of NCDOT, yeah. Okay. The question I want, to, or I want answered when this comes back to us is, is this or was this part of the original agreement mm -hmm. and subject to those covenants? I want an answer to that. Uh, it would also be nice to know some more information on the accidents. I had the same thoughts as well. I'm like, there's seven homes. How do you have seven accidents on this little bitty road? But if they're all pulling out in the day, I, I got it. Um, that's all I have. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Well, this is just one of these cases that I, I hate to see where you have existing neighbors have certain expectations and then those expectations are mm -hmm. not being met. I know we've talked in work sessions rather recently about situations mm -hmm. uh, like this. <laughs> Very recently, yeah. matter, yeah. <laughs> and, and and it's just even private agreements or covenants or not, I, I think we do need to, to look into that and, and and see what's what. So I would like some more information. Well, that, that's something that we are going to ask the applicant to look into. Again, it is a it is a private matter, so it's it's important for the applicant and the adjacent homeowners to be able to provide us some information on that. I mean, we will certainly investigate it in terms of recorded plats and things of that nature, but it is important that staff not evaluate a private covenants and you know make determinations on it, but we'll, we'll certainly raise that question and ask the applicant to be prepared to address how they're gonna deal with it. But, but what we can evaluate is the fact that these are what we would deem as ultra low density lots. Mm -hmm. And we often talk about the need of transitioning mm -hmm. density. We do it all over town and use it as a justification oftentimes that we're trying to transition the density. And we're talking about something that 8,000 square foot lots to the north and four to 14 acre lots to the south and west is a 6,000 square foot lot a transition? It's not. So what is the right size lot? And that is under our purview. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay, very good. This will go to our planning and zoning board. Do we have a date for that? Um, we do not have a date because what will happen uh, depends on, you know, we'll, we'll schedule it for the next available meeting, but if the applicant wants to submit new zoning conditions and there needs to be some negotiation about the wording and enforceability, we'll have to advertise again. So we'll, we will schedule it. We've put a to be determined to make sure we've allowed enough time. But the minimum time would be October meeting. Correct. The planning and zoning board, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, or later. More, more likely it will be November. Okay, very um, good. Okay. And the annexation will follow the? That will, you won't see action on that until the final town council meeting. Correct. Okay, very good, thank you. We now move to our second item, E2. It's a public hearing on the rezoning 12 REZ 17. We're gonna hear a report from our staff followed by the applicant, and then we're gonna open up the public hearing. The council will not take action on this item tonight. Instead, we're going to refer it to our planning and zoning board for their recommendation. Ms. Granin, once again, will present this item. Thank you. This is the request uh, made by Glenda Topp and Associates on behalf of the property owners for property located at 6910 Carpenter Fire Station Road on 5.35 acres. The vicinity map shows the subject property adjacent to a Cary Fire Station and on the north side of Carpenter Fire Station Road. It's an aerial view of the subject property and existing conditions and a different perspective to show the boundaries of the subject property. Carries land use plan designation for the property is office and institutional. And then there's an area of land on the property that has a parks and open space designation, which coincides with a, a stream buffer map, which you'll see shortly. The existing zoning is residential 40. The proposed zoning is office and institutional conditional use. <laughs> The applicant has proposed that any building on the site be limited to 25,000 square feet. And they've also proposed a condition that would provide additional permanent open space with an average width of 20 feet uh, to the south of the any stream buffers that are identified on the subject property. 
And as I mentioned, there is a GIS depicted stream buffer on the subject property. A field determination of that would be required at the time of site plan. The applicant has expressed awareness of that stream buffer and the, as I mentioned, the willingness to provide some additional open space adjacent to that to be compliant with the land use plan um, calling for additional open space in that vicinity. There's a greenway trail proposed on the northern side of the property and Parks, Recreation and Cultural Resources has reported that an easement off the subject property to the north has been dedicated and that shows the location of the future trail. Carries land use or transportation plan designates NC 55 and Carpenter Fire Station Road as major thoroughfares. Property owners within 400 feet of the subject property were notified by mail of the request and the property was posted and advertised. There have been no protest petitions and staff has not received any inquiries uh, on the proposed rezoning. And at this time, I'd like the applicant to step forward and speak to the request. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. My name is Glenda Topp with Glenda S. Topp and Associates. Um, as Deborah pointed out, um, the current zoning is R40. We're proposing O&I conditional use, and as you saw on the map to, along the rear of the property, there, was a, there is a designation of park and open space. So we, in working with staff, we added a condition that in addition to the stream buffer, we would provide additional open space. Um, to correspond to the land use plan. Um, we did have a neighborhood meeting. Um, a few people attended. There were no concerns raised at the meeting. Um, this uh, designation has been O&I for a while. It's also next to the fire station on Carpenter Fire Station Road. And um, given the fact that there have not been a lot of comments, I think I'm gonna stop and um, answer any questions if you have them. And the owner is here also. Um, if you have any questions, and thank you very much. Thank you. This time I'll open up the public hearing for this rezoning 12 REZ 17, and I would invite the first speaker forward at this time. Anyone at all for this public hearing? I see no one. I'll close the public hearing and open it up to council for questions or comments. Uh, Ms. Grannon, the the um, proposal is O and I conditional use. The Correct. condition is the space in the back. Plus the 25,000 square foot limit on the building. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? Just a comment, I don't really have any concerns over this one next to a fire station and commercial office seems to make sense and not very often we get residential coming in flipping to office. That's right. kind of a That's a new one. nice change. <laughs> so. Anything else? I guess the only concern I have, and I'll talk to the homeowners out here myself, is um, those homes that are still along Carpenter Fire Station Road, isn't there like some homes adjacent to this? And um, were they asking for buffers or anything like that? Or nothing like that? Okay. Do you have the land, does the land use? Um, it's designated for medium density residential. Mm -hmm. um, they had no concern. Um, w given the, the buffer that would be required, I mean, we are required to provide a buffer from office to medium density. And they're, and, they're and, good with that. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and you talked to the people who are directly adjacent. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, other questions? And this will go to our planning and zoning board. Do we have a date on this one, October? Or? That would... Um, just to allow time to process the staff report. This late, this late in September, chances of it going to October are, are a little tight, so. Probably November. Probably November. All right. <laughs> so next time I'll ask you, I'll preface it with a November. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we'll now move to item E3, is a public hearing on the annexations 12A11, 12A12. We may take action on this item tonight on a annexation 12A11. Annexation 12A12 will be on a future agenda for council's action to coincide with a corresponding rezoning request. Mr. Nicholas of our staff will present this item. Mr. Nicholas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, council. 
Uh, the first petition, item 12A11, is a request for annexation of approximately 90.45 acres located at 8700 Green Level Church Road, approximately 1900 feet northeast of the intersection with Green Level West Road. The request also includes an additional 0.36 acres of additional adjacent right of way. The site is in Cary ZTJ, has a current zoning designation of R40. The request is also associated with a subdivision plan, number 12 SB04, which is a proposed development of 108 lots. Uh, the second item for hearing tonight is petition 12A12, which is a request for annexation of approximately 18.94 acres located at 1708, 1712, 1716, and 1800 Wakina Road, and also 1708 Wakina Road B. The site is in Cary's ETJ and has a zoning designation of R40. The request is associated with a rezoning case, which is proposed amendment to the Highcroft Village PDD. It's also associated with a subdivision plan 12SB05, which is a proposed development of 73 lots. This concludes the presentation. Okay, very good. Uh, this time I'll open up the public hearing for these annexations and invite the first speaker forward. Is there anyone at all that would like to speak on these annexations? Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing and open it up to the council members for questions, comments, or a motion. Make Mr. a motion to approve annexation 12-A11. Second. There's a motion and a second discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And we do not need to take action on 12A12, which is following the uh, associated rezoning. Thank you, Mr. Nicholas. Thank you. We now move to committee reports. We have one item for discussion. Mm -hmm. And it's from two. 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 Oh, that's right. I forgot. I have it written down here. <laughs> Sorry. My mouth just doesn't follow my <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, we have two items for discussion. Uh, the first one's from the Planning and Development Committee on the Cedar Bend Subdivision Waiver Request. The committee's recommendation was not unanimous, so therefore it's in front of the council. And at this time, I'll uh, recognize Mr. Bailey for the staff's report. Mr. Bailey. Um, okay. This, uh, this development's located near the intersection of um, Lewis Stevens and um, um, McCrimmon Parkway. It's a smaller subdivision and it's along the path of our future reclaim system as it connects from our North Cary plan out west. Um, so it's directly in, in that corridor. Um, their request is to not make any internal lines within the development, the smaller four inch lines that would serve the homes or make any water meters or the connections to the system. They've done that and indicated by, um, by HOA covenants um, would prohibit irrigation sy um, systems and they would prohibit or actually require the use of uh, Bermuda grass within the development. Staff's recommending denial of that particular part of the request related to the internal lines. We would support actually connecting to the system because it's miles away. Um, they would temporarily connect to potable. Um, we also would support any meters in the short term um, unless there was you know, future request or need of the property owners, um, then the meters could be installed individually. Okay, very good. Mr. France, as committee chair, will you speak to this? Uh, yes, sir. Um, the committee unanimously supported all of the requests for waiver that were supported by staff. There was one, however, that we did not have unanimous agreement on. Um, two members of the committee actually supported requiring, uh, supported staff recommendation to require installing the four inch reclaim water line internally. Uh, I did not support that request, uh, really given the justification, the, the a homeowners association is going to <coughs> prohibit irrigation systems and require that they install heat tolerant Bermuda grass. Given that and the staff's justifications to support the other waiver requests, I just felt like making them go through the expense to bury four inch pipe under a bunch of streets was an that's gonna sit there and never be used. I just didn't see was a burden that we should be putting on the applicant. It just didn't make any sense for this pipe to sit underground for decades and not be used. Um, that's my opinion. The okay. other members of the committee, uh, yeah. I would encourage them to to speak to their thoughts on it. And that would be Ms. Adcock. Ms. Adcock and Mr. Yerha. Okay. Ms. Adcock, would you like to speak? Well, I think there's a consistency issue here with what we've um, required other 
<clears throat> developers to do in this same or similar situation, and I have some concerns about precedent setting, and we kind of talked about that mm -hmm. the other day. It, and I would actually like to ask the town attorney uh, if we're, or, or Mr. Bailey one, if we would be at greater risk uh, for not requiring uh, this development to put in the lines and then a future development comes in and we require them to put in the lines after we've already required another one to put in the lines. What's our risk there? Is that we are, we're at greater risk or n no change? Or? I believe this does establish some Thing like a precedent for you and if someone else were to come in and, and say they had the same kind of restrictions and will install Bermuda grass I think the expectation would be that you would take a similar approach to that request so yes I think it does establish a precedent okay. it establishes a precedent for future requests yeah. right not doesn't have impact on right. decisions that have been made in the past is that correct that's right it, it should be consistent with decisions in the past too but I'm not aware of any like Your house. No, well, that's that's our concern also. I mean, the uh, it, it seems like, if, if anything, and if I didn't support the staff request, I probably would have gone in the other direction, and wanted the service to the individual houses even. Uh, but I'm very comfortable with this, you know, with the staff recommendation, and we are concerned with precedent. Also, yeah, I, I'm concerned with that as well, and and, and I I know from living around people that they don't only irrigate grass, they irrigate plants, uh, and do they follow the covenants? It will depend on the, the homeowner association to enforce those covenants. Um, hey. it, it's a tough call. In regards to the precedent, if another plan was to come before me with similar sick or circumstances, and I mean, we just heard Mr. Bailey state, you know, reclaim water is miles away, mm -hmm. I would be inclined to waive the requirement on them as well. If it was much closer to reclaim water services, then I might not be so inclined. But you know, the HOA restrictions and those factors are why I don't support staff recommendation and I support the request for waiver. Okay. Is there further discussion or a motion? I'll make a motion to um, support the applicant's request for waiver from installing the four inch reclaim water line internally to the subdivision. Okay, in addition to the other waivers. The other waivers were already supported. Okay, I think so we're, we're only we're discussing that one that was not unanimous, correct? Mm -hmm, that's okay. correct. But we still have to make a so decision. Do we need a motion for that? Yeah, to make a decision on that. Okay, I'm sorry. I have two people. <laughs> right, sorry. Do we need to make a motion for the first two that are agreed upon because they're not on consent? It sounds like we're dealing with issues separately, and so you could vote on that first motion, and then we could deal with right. the others later. Yes. Yeah, that's the way I understood it. Mm -hmm. okay. So we have a motion. Is there a second? No second motion dies for lack of a second. Is there another motion? <clears throat> um, I'll move that um, we support the staff's recommendation to deny the applicant's request for a waiver from installing the four inch reclaim water line internally to the subdivision. Okay. Second. There's a motion, second. Discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Motion carries six to one. Is there a follow up motion? Mm -hmm. I'll follow up motion. Um, I move that we. Um, approve the staff's recommendation to support the applicant's request for a waiver from making the connection to the existing reclaim water system and from the requirement to install services to individual lots based on the initial prohibition of individual irrigation systems. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. We have one more item on the agenda. And that's item 3B from the consent, which is Parkside Town Commons. And Ms. Robinson, do you have specific questions or you want to? I'll let uh, Mr. Jensen go ahead and give us his um, one minute elevator speech on this and then I'll ask my questions. <laughs> I'll, tr I'll try to make this brief. Um, Parkside Town Commons uh, has made a formal request to, uh, to the town to waive uh, a portion of their required CTP widenings uh, along O'Kelly Chapel Road extension. Um, their current plans that are approved by the town is for a four-lane roadway, median divide roadway through through that portion of the development. Uh, and in addition to those uh, basic four-lane sections, they also have numerous left-turn lanes and right-turn lanes. Um, they've come into the town to make some minor modifications uh, to their site plan uh, for their phase one improvements, which basically consist of the retail area on the south side 
of Old Kelly Chapel Road. Um, nothing's currently being uh, contemplated on the north side at this point in time. Uh, staff supports this request uh, on the basis that um, uh, with some earlier modeling that was done uh, back during the 2008 CTP uh, uh, update, um, it was unclear whether this road uh, maybe even should be a six-lane roadway. It was, it was approaching that threshold where it was uh, where a four or a six-lane roadway would, would probably be workable. Um, but I think to be conservative, the town decided to make this section a six-lane uh, roadway on the CTP plan. Since that time, with the uh, uh, NC 540 toll road going open up, uh, staff feels uh, that probably the volumes won't ever get to the level of a six-lane roadway needed. And again, the, the development plan has a, a, a multitude of, of uh, double left turn lanes and right turn lanes along this stretch of road. So we feel that adequate capacity will be, will be uh, provided along this roadway. Um, and, but you are re requesting that the original right of way that would be required for a six lane road still be dedicated. That's correct, which would be 124 feet. 124 feet. Yes. So for a six lane road, we usually have a 30 foot wide median. In, in this particular section, uh, it, was, uh, the, it was an 18 foot median, not a 30. Okay, because the other Again, ones. Again, with the, level, the double left turn lanes, you probably, mm -hmm. that's eating out what probably, what may have been exactly a 30 foot median, but. Um, okay, that's, that's a that, good that's point. That's the big difference is there's so much traffic coming in out side street that double left turn lanes eats up almost, almost the entire median. Okay, the Chapel Hill Road, McCrimmon Parkway, Morrisville Parkway, Carytown Boulevard, all six lane roads all on the CTP with a 30 foot wide median. Our four lane roads have typically an 18 foot median. So if we are, this section is having the land reserved 124 feet, that tells me that you guys are saying, hey, let's just kind of keep our options open in case traffic does get bad here and we need to move this over to a six lane road. But the median is coming in at, a, at an 18 foot. And so that, that's my area of reservation. And I'm trying to figure out what that median is going to look like. If you have an 18 foot median and then you get these cutouts for double lefts, do you end up with a three foot monolithic concrete it, median It'll be then? in the range of probably four to six feet and it'll be a uh, monolithic island to our standards. We're, we're trying to discuss with DOT right now to um, make that more of our standard, which is a, a uh, stamped brick concrete mm -hmm. or, or actually brick uh, and give it some um, clear definition more so than, than the standard just a concrete island. Right, because I, I recall that NCDOT won't allow any kind of vegetation in the median in fewer than eight feet width sections. Maybe it's 10 foot now. Uh, yeah, depending on the vegetation. Yeah, usually uh -huh. uh, if you want to put plant trees, it's got to be even larger than that, but for shrubs and things of that nature, yeah, it'd have to be at least that. Okay, yeah. my impression from this is if we are saying that we're gonna ask them to reserve the right of way for 124 feet with the potential that someday this, if traffic does become significant in this area, we might have to go in and add another lane, then we ought to be having that median built to the standard of a six lane, a 30 foot. I mean, at the worst case scenario, you have a good looking cross section right. for a road that has never been put in yet. I mean, this is brand new road. We're not ta taking about, talking about taking somebody's front yard or anything like that. It's just about saying, hey, this land is being reserved for, the, for this road anyway. Let's go ahead and make sure we get a median in there that's appropriate for future growth and for a really good looking project. I'm, I personally don't like to see the three foot. If for nothing else, people trying to cross have very little refuge on a three foot segment. Well, I do want to kind of clarify that, you know, in, a, in, a, um, in our standard 18 foot uh, grassed islands, um, at intersections where we have to cut in a left turn lane, you know, 12 feet is usually taken out of that only le leaving six. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, since they are needing double left turn lanes, which is 24 feet, they're actually are, if you're just a basic section of median, they are providing like a 30 foot median, but they're having to cut out two left turn lanes for that. So um, that's so really kind of the left, the left turn lanes is really what's cutting out of the, of the median that, that, we, what, that we normally would desire. Okay, so. If that makes sense. <laughs> so you're saying without the two left turn lanes, it really would be a 30 foot median. Correct. Okay, so are there, so the edge of the roadway, the four 
foot lanes, the four, excuse me, the four lanes now, is that at the edge of the 124 feet, or do you still have capacity to add in exactly one lane, or do you have one lane plus some extra vegetation? We, we would actually, because they're providing right turn lanes at all their entrances, we'd actually have, um, we could push the curb out and um, it, we wouldn't have to affect any vegetation or sidewalk, but it, but it would eliminate the right turn lane going into the developments unless okay. we decided to, to build. You know, so that's what they're getting by having us come in with this more narrow or with the median that they have proposed now is that you have the capacity to have a right, a dedicated right turn lane. Well, that's, that's basically true, yeah. Okay. That's fine. Could I add one, one bit of information? The wider medians are great, not only the, for the visual things, but for the separation of vehicles and safety. But this road is fairly short from 55 to the railroad tracks where it abuts to RTP and the intersection needs to align on the opposite side of 55. And if we have a really wide median, it wouldn't work there. So we'd have to start and error and flare out. Okay. And RTP and the railroad crossing have already been sort of set up as four lanes. So we really would not have hardly any, I don't know, I'm not even sure we could ever even get to the full width in the period we have to transition from either okay. end. That's so it complicates it a little bit in this case, but we, we definitely like the Cary Parkway width and feel and want to accommodate wherever we can. But this one is somewhat constrained on either end now I because see. of what's been built. Okay, that's good information. So everywhere we have 30 foot medians, I mean, they cut into that when you've got turn lanes. They do. Yeah, yes. yeah but then you still have enough land left over uh, for vegetation, number one, and number two, for people to, you have that wider width gives you the ability to make a safe U-turn movement. You, you look at Davis Drive with the narrow mm -hmm. median width there, which I advocated for, <laughs> and, and now it's almost impossible to do a U-turn on that street. So it makes it very, it's very challenging, I think. So, okay, all right, well, that, that's good information. I'll, I'll go along with it. I just so wanna make sure like we weren't. Make a motion. <laughs> No, I wouldn't like to make a motion, but I'll support it. All right, make a motion to approve <laughs> staff recommendation. <laughs> okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. <laughs> we'll now go in the closed session. I would entertain a motion to do so. Uh, pursuant to GS 143-318.11A4 and 3, I move that we hold a closed session to one, discuss matters relating to the location or expansion of industries or other businesses in the town, including agreements on a tentative list of economic development incentives that may be offered by town in negotiation. Two, consult with attorneys employed by and or retained by the town in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorneys and the town. And three, to prevent the disclosure of information that is made privileged or confidential by GS 143-318.1.10E. There's a motion, is there a second? Second. Second, discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are in closed session.
We'll reconvene our council meeting. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. There's a motion second. and a second. Discussion. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a production of Cary TV. Visit the Town of Cary website at townofcary.org.